Hello, and welcome to the Geoeconomics Podcast. Today, I will be talking to Sam Wyman. Sam Wyman is a former CIA officer who spent more than 31 years working for the agency. Now, he is the chairman and chief operating officer of Jefferson Waterman International, or JWI. JWI is a global consulting firm which has helped its clients operate in risky environments in regions such as the Middle East, West Africa, Eastern Europe, and Southeast Asia. It works with governments as well as private companies. With that, I would like to welcome Sam Wyman onto the Geoeconomics Podcast. So I was wondering if you could uh, start by talking a bit about the history of uh, Jefferson Waterman International and um, a bit about your activities in the last few years. Okay, Jefferson Waterman International, otherwise known as JWI, uh, was created in about 1994 by Charles Waterman, myself, and a couple of other people, including State, the State Department and private sector individuals, to be a strictly international business development and public affairs firm operating only overseas in the sense that we don't do business in the U.S. for U.S. companies. We will do business overseas for U.S. companies or for non-U.S. companies overseas, but we are strictly international. Uh, we've been operating for 25 years. Um, we're not a large firm. We're only about, I think, in our, when we were the largest, we were about 15. We're now three. But that's the way we like to be, lean and mean. Um, we do operate in West Africa. We operate in the Middle East. We operate in Latin America, uh, Eurasia, a little bit in Europe. Depends on why we used to operate a lot in Europe um, or do business a lot in Europe um, in defense sales and things of this nature, to Spain, UK, what have you. Um, we deal, we are not a loving firm. We do, on occasion, help a foreign government build relationships in the U.S., in the executive branch, or at State Department, or on the Hill, but we don't advocate for the foreign principle. We might advise the foreign principle on what the issues are and how to address those issues, but the foreign principle is on his or her own when it comes to talking to a congressman or a senator or a government official. We won't do that. We do register um, when we represent certain foreign governments of foreign interests. We register with the Department of Justice as we're supposed to. But that does not mean that we are lobbyists or advocates. Um, we are not engineers, we are not architects, we are not road builders. But we do put engineers, architects, and road builders together with opportunities in the overseas market where their specific skills can be, need, can be deployed, but they don't have the contact lines to build a relationship or pursue a relationship or get themselves out of difficulties if such difficulties should occur. So, um, what would be a typical use case of your scenarios? What might a, a common customer look like? Look like? Well, it could be anybody. It could be a it could be a company. It could be a government ministry. It could be uh, a politician. Are there any specific examples that you can talk about of past work that you have done? We have represented the government of Ghana, for example, here, um, working in league with their embassy as well as with their presidency and the prime minister's office, helping them build uh, commercial and economic relationships uh, with uh, outreach to the State Department and others. Um, in some cases, there have been specific requirements for helping find someone or find a company that can help them build a pipeline from an offshore oil uh, field into a refinery in country. Uh, we will help them do that. We'll put them together with one or more candidates, and then we'll help them negotiate, build a relationship, and then we'll nurture that relationship and see to it that, or do our best to see to it that it will be productive for the client and, and frankly, be profitable for us. 
So we've done this and we've represented Romania here for most favored nation treatment. We represented Nicaragua in the days right after the Sundan just after the Sundanesas were were voted out, uh, helped them build rebuild their relationships here, helped the Nicaraguan government. Uh, we currently represent the Ivory Coast. They've got a variety of different issues that, that need addressing. Um, we are talking to other certain other governments about similar types of relationships. I think the important thing for, for me to, to emphasize is that our stock and trade is access. Uh, my colleagues and I collectively represent about 150 years service overseas, where we have built up in respective different countries, uh, to use an ar archaeological term, Rolodexes of considerable length and size of contacts and relationships. We like to say we either know, we know who to call in a foreign country to fix a problem or to call someone to find out who to call. Uh, we won't necessarily be able to fix the problem ourselves, but we can put the company or one of our people, the U.S. State Department or otherwise, in touch with the right people to get something done. Recently, China and Russia have been in the news because they may have attempted to influence U.S. politics. While you are not a lobbyist, you have a FARA registered company and are in touch with the FARA registration ecosystem. Has there been a recent proliferation of foreign FARA registered groups attempting to lobby or influence U.S. politics? Uh, I think there's a proliferation of registrations, not necessarily a proliferation of lobbyists. The registrations, because of all of the scandals that come out of have come out of the Russian issue of the elections and investigations, have turned up a number of companies that never did register, and now they're being so people are being very very careful. The basic law is that if you represent a foreign principle to influence a policy decision in this country, well, then you better register. And so that depends upon how Catholic you want to be in terms of um, adhering to the letter of the law or skating. It just depends. Has enforcement activity um, noticeably increased since the 2016 election? Oh, definitely. It's uh, Just have to read the papers. Is there, uh, as a result of this increased enforcement activity, um, companies or organizations that might have relatively benign goals um, that, that are maybe perhaps getting swept up into this, uh, I might be thinking of an organization like, you know, Children of Armenia Friends or Friends of uh, Mortuania who might be doing some activity that's like 501c3, educating the public, but about um, things that may be on the fence and fairly mundane. Uh, uh, you're talking about sl slavery in Mortuania? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, or just I just gave that as an example of... Um, no, no, fair enough, but I've just yeah. I've, I've kind of pinned been, been down your, your question. Um, there are issues that have to be dealt with, and uh, sometimes the government will come out and ask for our help as to how to how how they should go about it. Uh, we have been talking to Mauritania over the years on just just these kind of things. What do we do? And we try to help them figure out how to do it, how so, to deal with it. So I want to move gears a bit and talk about um, JWI's activities overseas. Um, so, in terms of the the U.S. has typically, for many decades, um, through the help of international organizations, maintained a very large economic presence in many countries that are developing in West Africa, Latin America, and elsewhere. But for the first time, you're seeing that China and other countries are now providing uh, significant competitive services. Um, what to what degree are people in Washington D.C. Aware of this Chinese competition for international influence and international markets, and what is the general sentiment? Well, I think there are certain some realities that we have to face. One of which is that the the Chinese know no restrictions when it comes to doing foreign business and foreign markets. They will bribe, cajole, give money, however you want to call it. The U.S. is pretty strict about it, how it operates, and they 
Um, yeah, like it seems that the U.S. legislation where it's illegal for U.S. citizens to bribe foreign officials abroad, um, regardless of, you know, the morality of it, would give a huge advantage to countries that are less does. scrupulous like it China. Does. It does, very definitely. We cannot, in that respect, strictly speaking, we cannot compete with the Chinese. We cannot go into a place and drop 12 or $15 million willy-nilly on a foreign government or a foreign minister or a minister of a foreign government and expect to get a contract. It just doesn't happen that way. Um, we can go in with promises to build a road or something else for that government on behalf of the government, but to build it for free of charge as a gift or something like that, no, we don't do it. So. So what strategies can U.S. companies that are overseas and might be seeing, for example, Chinese competition in the real estate sectors, what tactics can they do to remain competitive, but also keep their business within American norms of ethical and legal boundaries? Persuade that the foreign client that the American product is going to last a lot longer than the Chinese product will. And that, that speaks to road building. It speaks to... to in, uh, machinery and products, the, the, with due respect to the Chinese abilities, their equipment is pretty shoddy in generally in general terms, and they, the equipment tends to break down and fall apart. Their roads don't last that long, um, but they will build a road network for free for a particular country that wants roads, and they'll take those roads and live with it. That's the, the issue. We build for the long term. They build for the short term. Uh, short term. So how can Americans communicate that American products are superior to Chinese products and, and compete in that sense? Compare and contrast. Show the product. Demonstrate the road building. Show what happens. If you take a look at you, this is probably a bad example because there's been so much fighting in Yemen. But the Chinese built a large network of roads in the Yemen. Before all the fighting broke out, those roads were falling apart because they didn't dip, go down deep enough to build the base, the supporting platforms and so on for the, for the asphalt. And so you end up with rivers of roads, which is kind of tricky when you're trying to drive along it. So it's basically to point out the qualitative difference between the end product rather than the immediate gain. So. So I've heard people um, in, in Africa and Asia make the case that doing business with the Chinese, although there are certain disadvantages like the corrupt that come with it, there's a certain advantage in that the U.S., regardless of the truth, has this perception of being a sort of a, an imperial power, um, which has supported uh, governments and regimes which are, which are illegitimate. And many people argue that... Um, and once again, considering you know what Xi Jinping is doing, I could see very well the uh, the American case that this is the opposite. But what would you argue to the to the governments that argue that Chinese investment comes with less of the strings attached in the long term that the American investments have come with? I cannot speak to specific issues. I do know that the the Chinese tend to bring their own labor into a project and the labor will stay there after the project right. is over with. That uh, kind of shoots a hole in the government's uh, claim for building, getting jobs, and what have you. To me, that's one of the biggest failures. Uh, well, not failures, but the biggest differences between uh, um, the American way of doing it and, shall we say, Chinese way of doing it. What we try to do, what we promote, and what JWI promotes is two things. One, we will never tell a foreign government how to do its business. We will go to a foreign government or company or a project and say, okay, what do you want? We will not impose on them. What do you want? And then we will figure out how to address what they want in the most effective, cost-effective way possible. And sometimes we will bring our own people out to train the locals how to do the job, and then we will withdraw. In some cases, we'll bring the locals here to the home, to the headquarters company, and be trained here, send them back. It just, But we will not 
as a general rule, send our own workforce over to do something as a general rule. Well, there's a um, very interesting sort of example, and, and this is this is anecdotal, but I think it's it's quite emblematic in many ways of what's going on. Where the Bay Bridge was damaged, uh, the Bay Bridge from uh, Oakland to San Francisco in California was damaged after the uh, earthquake in the late 1980s, and it took you know 20 years to rebuild because of uh, a lot of bureaucratic complications and slow service. And you compare that to the rate at which you see China's development during that same period, you know. That same period was the time when Deng Xiaoping was in office and completely transformed the Chinese economy. And, you know, although it's a bit later, you can also look at, say, the, the speed at which the Chinese built the uh, all of the Olympic stadiums in 2008. Um, how can the U.S. really regain that competitive edge and, and really uh, begin building infrastructure at, at the same rates and, and at the same sort of... Um, uh, c competitiveness that that's the uh, Chinese have in recent decades. I would say rationalize our own bureaucratic policies, our own bureaucratic re regulations. I will give you a case in point. Um, in the mid-70s in Egypt, there was a crying need for low-cost housing. A, there was a real need for it. B, it would be a, a political benefit to the Sadat government to show its people that they were doing something. Uh, it was suggested to the local, the USAID mission to, uh, leadership in Egypt at the time, that this is something that the US could do very quickly and get a lot of benefit from it. The immediate response was, we need to do a feasibility study. And the feasibility study is gonna take six months. The response is obvious. I mean, you don't, I mean, I could take the individuals in question out in the middle of the desert and say, look, there it is, you figure it out. But you don't have to bring out all sorts of people and do all sorts of studies. The need is there, the need is real, do it. Uh, Chinese will do that. Now, I don't guarantee that the houses will last forever, but they get the job done and they, get, they achieve the, the immediate end. Uh, it has nothing to do with whether the local government is a dictatorship or not. The need is there, and the U.S. could gain a lot of benefit from demonstrating that it is responding to a real need in the country. So while China is um, catching up on the infrastructure side of thing, America is uh, undeniably the uncontested winner in terms of the culture wars. Nobody's watching Chinese movies. Everybody's watching Hollywood, and everybody's using you know, American tech services like you know, Facebook, Google, YouTube. Um, how has this affected perceptions in countries such as, for example, West Africa or Central America? Do the people in the governments especially uh, say, well, China is better for this or and, uh, the infrastructure, but will we'll be more sort of um, amenable to American consumer tastes in these other areas? Or are they, are they, are they more sort of just ambiguous, un unambiguously on the side of uh, America in terms of the... Uh, mentality of the people in the governments um, because the pop culture is more in line with America. Well, I wouldn't say anything has anything to do with pop culture so much as it does the fact that, that fortunately I think the U.S. still enjoys a reputation for quality product, quality performance. Uh, I think that often the government in question will, perhaps too late, realize that having cut a deal with the Chinese for a certain project, they end up on the wrong end of the stick because the, again, the whole question of labor and costs and things of this nature come into play, which doesn't always happen with us. But I can't, I can't cite you any specific examples, but I just know that as a general uh, business trend, that's the way it is. Recently, Trump had his peace summit with Kim Jong-un in Singapore. And over the last decade, it seems like North Korea has been slowly opening up. Um, you've, you've seen things like the Kaesong Industrial Zone in Pyongyang, where there is foreign manufacturing that's in Singapore, uh, that, that's in uh, North Korea. You're seeing, you know, the tourism of industry opening up. And uh, recently, the North Korean uh, leader is, you know, taking pictures with uh, Moon Jae-in and all of that. Do you think that there are any um, real peace opportunities in North Korea and business opportunities should the country open up? 
Well, if the country opens up, yes. Well, what do you think the likelihood would be of the country opening up? You I don't. don't. I don't. I really don't. Uh, if you, you know as well as I do that there's generations have lived under this North Korean system. They don't know any different. You have a few defectors who come out, but they, the message has never gotten back that things really are better on the outside. Um, the control of King, Kim Jong-un and his relatives over the system is total. Uh, you have to ask yourself why whenever Kim Jong-un is out giving a speech, you've got a lot of little psychopaths going and taking notes. That's so that everybody can remember what he said and repeat it back to him, because that's what he loves. Um, I think the North Koreans are deathly afraid of being overthrown from the outside. I think that the chances of a, an agreement, unless the South Koreans make tremendous concessions, I just, I just don't see it happening. So it's a very different situation than, say, existed with uh, East-West Germany in 1988 mm -hmm. with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Mm -hmm. What factors in North Korea make it so that North Korea is not going to have a, a Yeltsin or a Deng Xiaoping type figure that, that attempts to reform the economy and move things into a more open and uh, liberal economic paradigm? I would say control of, the, control of the country by... Kim Jong-un and his people is the biggest issue, is my, in my opinion. They're afraid to give in any, any inch of, of power. Whereas Yeltsin, when he was sober, it didn't bother him. He felt that this was something he could deal with. And I think the same thing with Deng Xiaoping. He didn't feel threatened. He had worked his magic, if you will, within the party and was felt completely in control. I think Kim Jong-un is and he wakes up every morning and he says, thank God I made it another day. I mean, one of these days, somebody's going to take, do something. Russia obviously exerts a great degree of geopolitical and economic control over its neighbors through the Eurasian Union. Is Russia still a major player today in more distant countries and locations like West Africa or Latin America? No question. Uh, Vladimir Putin's goal is to restore the glory of the Russian Empire. I don't mean that facetiously. I think it's a real, it's his goal. And he's doing everything he can to displace the U.S. Uh, Syria is a perfect example. Um, the Obama administration helped him along the line by declaring a red line and then not uh, supporting it. And basically, uh, allowed the Russians to co-opt us in the Middle East. It's really what's happening. Now, um, Saudis, Emiratis, others are very concerned about um, Russian influence. So they're, they tend for the moment to stay uh, on our side, as it were. But that could change. It could change if our international politics change. What factors do you think would need to change for those countries to uh, align more with Russia? If we withdraw and pull back, uh, lessen the amount of aid that we give, if we, I think a, a test case is underway right now with the what's happening on the West Bank, Palestine, and what the U.S. is doing and not doing vis-a-vis -vis Israel. These are issues that, even though they may not make much sense to those of us living outside, on the ground there, that makes a lot of sense. And the U.S. traditionally has been a supporter of Israel, and President Trump is emphasizing that. And I think as long as the, as long as the Americans are willing to give good terms on military supplies and foreign aid and what have you will be all right. The moment we start withdrawing that, pulling back on that, the Russians are going to move right in. So suppose that there's a scenario where um, uh, some, some, there's a political change in the U.S. and the U.S. greatly withdraws from the Middle East uh, from a military perspective, cuts foreign aid, stops training, say, the militaries and stops the arms sale. 
and this leads to an increase in Russian influence. What effects will this have? Uh, what, what, what negative effects will this have on the countries over there and, and on the world as a whole? Well, on the countries over there, it will have a, a significant effect in that the American business will probably also be shut out. I think in part in terms of politics, if, if we are not there on the ground in one way or another, the Russians will be. It's very clear. If you take a look at Egypt in the uh, 60s and 70s, Americans weren't there. The Egyptians were, the Russians were in complete control. We changed that with, or actually the, the Arabs gave us an invitation by staging the 73 war. However, the way these things change. So it, it seems like um, that the Russian influence in a lot of these countries um, at the very least, it seems like it's popular. Um, w would you argue that that is the case? That, uh, for example, you know, in 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 Syria, there's a lot of people uh, all over the Middle East that generally are very happy that Russia is supporting Bashir al-Assad. They make the case that um, you know Russia is fighting ISIS, and and whether or not it's true um, that uh, America had some role in the creation of ISIS, and that Russia is sort of uh, siding with these authoritarian governments that, that exist, but that despite the fact they're authoritarian, they're secular and manage to maintain order. Um, it also seems that to some degree, uh, the Russians, you know, from the perspective of people maybe in, in elsewhere in Eastern Europe and the Middle East, um, tend to be very supportive of the Russian cause in places like the Donbass Republic. Um, does this seem to align with maybe the perceptions in the government, or do you think that this is limited maybe to more fringe or maybe far left or far right political movements in these countries? That's one heck of a question. Um, maybe we could break it down and look at, for example, Syria first. Well, let's look at Syria. We go back to the invasion of Iraq in 2003, major mistake. Uh, go back to the World Trade Center Tower bombings. Those bombings, I think, were generally a reflection of frustration and uh, anger at the Americans for having supported what a lot of people consider to be the, the autocratic regimes that you've talked about. We, the U.S., went into Iraq to supposedly create a new world in the Middle East when I was a rather silly justification it didn't have any bearing basis in fact, and all it did was to basically destroy a country, and that created, led to the rise of ISIS and Al-Qaeda, what have you, and immediate threat against the Alawite regime of Bashar. Um, in the eyes of most Syrians, we, the U.S., did very little, if anything, to prevent Bashar from taking action against most of the Sunnis in the country and a large number of Shia. Um, I served in Syria. I know the country quite well. I've stayed in touch with a lot of people there. It's unfortunate. There's a great deal of anger against the U.S. Christians are happy, in a sense, because Bashar is anti anti-Muslim, if you will, if you put it that way. That's the wrong term, anti-Sunni. And if you read the rhetoric, you know, on Russia today, it's, or, or Sputnik, it's all about how, you know, the Russian army is coming in to protect the Syrian Christians, and it sort of aligns neatly with Putin's yeah. um, propaganda coup <coughs> destroying Christianity for yep. the Soviets at yep. home. For the Russians at home. Sorry, sorry, for the Russians at home. No, Russia, but just destroying it from very the real Soviet people, very real yeah. issues. No, this is very, very, very true. Um, so uh, let's look at another, you know, case of well-publicized Russian intervention, and this is the whole situation with the Ukrainian crisis. I've heard a lot of people, once again, rarely in Western countries, um, but make the case that uh, Ukraine was well within the Russian sphere of influence. It was a Eurasian country, and then in 2013, 2014, you have this color revolution, and that Russia was merely intervening in the country, um, in the southern region, in Crimea, and in you know, Donbass and Donetsk. Um, 
only to uh, to promote its interest and, and, and sort of prevent itself from losing territory. And they actually would maybe go as far as making the case that the fact that the U.S. is supporting the new Ukrainian regime is, is almost like uh, imperialism and the U.S. further encroaching deeper into the Russian sphere of influence. Well, that's certainly the way the Russians would look at it, because if you look at historically speaking, Ukraine has always been a buffer between Mother Russia and, Europe, and Western Europe, particularly with the... <coughs> Excuse me, with the emergence of NATO after the Second World War. When Ukraine went independent and was seeking membership in NATO and it becoming part of the European body, I think the Russians saw that as a, as a, a mortal threat and set about addressing it. And to me, it's as simple as that. And from a geopolitical, geostrategic issue, with Ukraine independent and going west, the Russians had, from their point of view, no choice but to go in and stage the, the revolution and the, the coups and so on and move into the Crimea and what have you. I mean, to me, it was we didn't do anything to stop it. They just came right in. What do you think are some of the macro geopolitical trends right now that are going to have the most impact for people in uh, in business and logistics and private equity in terms of uh, reshaping the global business climate. Um, what, what, what trends do, do people doing business need to wrap their heads around? Hmm. The growing influence of technology, I mean, that's an oversimplified statement, but if you take um, information technology, computers, what have you, and the, their impact on labor. And I think that to me, that's something that, that everybody has to get their head around. And the fact that so much of the of Western technology rests upon education and the ability to use technology, whereas in the third world, if I could use that term, it's slow coming. So a lot of people have to do a lot of learning and also to afford computers. One thing is to be able to have a cheap cell phone and have connection. Another one is to be able to buy a laptop and have Wi-Fi and connect to the Internet. However, when they do get access to Wi-Fi and the Internet and they see how the rest of the world lives, that creates geopolitical strains within a country and between countries. So governments have to face these realities, and the U.S. has to face those as well in terms of how are we going to deal with it. So It's... Uh... Yeah, I have some uh, very interesting, uh, a very interesting personal anecdote. Where I had the chance of meeting Mikhail Svetov, who is a um, a young guy about my age, you know, in Russia, a bit older. He uh, basically started a Facebook page, and he got seventeen thousand people out in the streets of Moscow protesting against Putin's re-election. And of course, he gets arrested, tortured, and now, of course, has to live in in exile. But you can see how just some, you know, random guy on the internet. Uh, no particular background, um, caused enough unrest in Russia in 2014 that it was, it made the international press and uh, uh, it, and I guess you can see similar trends with the Arab Spring and even to a lesser degree with ISIS and maybe with right-wing terrorism and more nefarious groups uh, recruiting. How should governments address this um, and balance sort of the fine line between protecting people's civil liberties but preventing these highly disruptive groups, uh, maybe like ISIS or violent extremists, from using the Internet as a means for recruitment? I don't think you can ever prevent ISIS from using the Internet. I mean, all you need is a cell phone and, and access to Wi-Fi, and you can carry on with it. I think what you need is messaging. You've got to come up with a stronger message um, to point up the shortcomings and the dangers of ISIS, Qaeda, etc., and you also have to be able to show to the people, you as the head of government, that what your policies are aimed at and are slowly accomplishing is to get rid of those conditions that give rise to ISIS. And that's a, a long-term issue. But if, if the people do not see positive results coming from the governments they're currently supporting, they're going to say to themselves, why should I support them? ISIS promised me this, that, so on and so forth. So I'm going to go with them because it's a near-term benefit, they think. It isn't until after they get into ISIS and become suckered into ISIS 
they realize that it's a different world. Right. So I want to end this podcast by talking a bit about what type of our listeners would be interested in JWI services and uh, how can they contact you? Well, very simply, they can get in touch with us through www.jwidc.com. We'll put the link in the description. Yeah, well, that's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, what type of um, people, uh, 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 for example, maybe uh, private equity, uh, what type of our listeners do you think would be the most interested in what you have to offer? Those that want to do business in certain countries uh, where we have had experience or where we know the people, they would want to get in touch with us. And the best way to find that out, find that out is to go on the website. And I mean, we... We are, reiterate that we're a small company. We we have never advertised for any of our contractual work over 25 years. We've gotten where we've gotten by word of mouth and referral. And so over time, people have begun to realize that there is a small company that's willing to go where a lot of big companies won't go, we don't want to go or can't afford to go. We do go. And we... We're ready to, if you will, get our hands dirty, so to speak, by going into difficult areas where living conditions aren't the best in the world, or uh, the water isn't safe to drink, or the food is never washed, or whatever you want to call it. We we do it, and we help American business or European or non-American business build relationships and build uh, uh, profitable projects. Well, thank you very much for coming on to the uh, Geoeconomics podcast and speaking to me today. I think it was a uh, fantastic conversation. Happy to help. I would like to, once again, thank Sam Wyman for talking to us today on the Geoeconomics podcast. We would also like to thank you, our listeners. This podcast is licensed under Creative Commons with Attribution. Our listeners have permission to re-upload, remix, reuse, or use this podcast for any purpose. This podcast is brought to you by the Adrianople Group. The Adrianople Group is a business intelligence and marketing firm specializing in providing services to economic zones and charter cities. For more information, you can find our website in the links below.